Hi gang, welcome to chapter two or module two in CTS 1110. Well, we're going to proceed on the same path we were on before relative to operating systems. In the last module we talked about the different types of operating systems and what an operating system did. Now in this module we're going to plan an installation and actually install Windows 10. And then talk about what do you do after you've got the installation done. Okay. So we'll talk about planning. If you're going to plan to do something we need to think about the different options available to us. Just like if you were planning to go on a vacation. Well, where can we go? Do we have everything we need to go where we want to go? Or do we have the time? So we have to think about the resources that are required. And we're talking about a vacation, time, money, the capacity to actually do whatever it is that we want to do. And then beyond that, What's it going to take to actually make it happen? Just because I have the resources available may not be everything involved. Okay. So I might have everything I need to do it, but there could be some limitations when it comes to actually doing this task, whatever we're going to do. Okay. So let's look at the planning aspect of it. So we need to look at the different operating system types and what it is they do or how and why they do what they do. Now, we talked about in the last type, in the last uh, module, the difference, distinct difference between a Mac OS and a PC OS. So if you're thinking about what operating system am I gonna install, the hardware you have will in part dictate which options you have. So if you have Mac hardware or Apple hardware, you're limited to those specific operating systems. And then based on whatever hardware configuration you have beyond the manufacturer, let's say what processors there or how much RAM you have or the hard drive, whatever it may be, um, from there, that will even more narrowly define what options you have and may limit you to one. On the PC side, uh, we're not limited to very few. We have a variety of Microsoft operating systems we can choose. We've got Linux operating systems. For this module, we're gonna focus primarily on Windows and the installation of Windows operating system, most current at the time of this recording would be Windows 10. And what requirements exist to do a Windows 10 install and what options we have? Is there more than one Windows 10? Well, yeah, we've got different versions of Windows 10. We've got three different versions. We've got Home, Pro, Enterprise that we're gonna deal with in this scenario. So let's take a step forward and you'll hear the equipment or the, the term OEM and that's Original Equipment Manufacturer. And there's licensing for these operating systems. And what it boils down to is how many instances of an install are you allowed? Now, just because you bought it, it doesn't mean you can do whatever you want to with this operating system or this software. You're buying the rights to use it within a certain scope of option, options. You can install it so many times and then that's it. When you go beyond that, you are violating the licensing agreements or the terms of that OEM manufacturer license. And you could be fined. They could sue you. It's a variety of things that they could do. Um, so from that point, we'll assume that we've got an avenue to acquire this license, to acquire this software. 
I could buy it from a retailer, I could buy it online. And depending on what it is, how I acquire it would dictate the media that it exists on. Is it something I download over the internet? And if I do download it over the internet, where am I downloading it to? Am I downloading it to a DVD, to a USB? There are versions of operating systems that are too big to fit on a DVD. They're just that bloated or heavy with files. So if they can't go on a DVD, then I would be limited to a USB drive to be able to use that as the media to uh, install the software. Now, so we've taken into account the different types of media that may be required. Could be a DVD, could be a USB. Um, we're not gonna see anything on a CD. That's not gonna happen with what we've got going on today size-wise. So we know where we're going to store this software should we need it. There's a product key that is commonly associated with the software, and that is an activation key. That's how they know which person you are relative to the install, that as well as registering your install of the software. So let's say I, I purchased it or and I, I bought it at a store. They gave me, they handed me a DVD and said, here's your software. With that DVD comes a product key, which will allow me to activate this software. And I need to know whether this is going to be a 32-bit or 64-bit installation. Now that depends on the architecture of the system that I'm installing it on. If we're talking about PC, it's one of two at this point. It's either a 32-bit architecture or 64-bit. Depending on the architecture, that will dictate what the requirements are for the installation. So if I have, let's say a 32-bit architecture and I'm going to install Windows 10 Home or Windows 8.1, if I have beyond four gig of memory RAM, the system is not going to acknowledge any more than four gig. It's not that it won't do the install. It's not that it won't work. It's that it only recognizes the first four gig. Anything beyond that, it ignores. It doesn't recognize it. It can't interact with it, handle it. it it's like it, it's not even there. So if we're talking about a 32-bit architecture, it really doesn't matter which version of Windows you're gonna install on a residential side or uh, non-commercial user, home editions for the most part, it, you're looking at four gig. So any of these that are listed here, you get it's gonna recognize four gig of RAM and that's it. But if we had a 64-bit architecture, okay, the motherboard and the processor are designed to work at 64 bits, then we've got the capacity of having far more memory. Between home at 8.1, we're at 128 gig. If we come up to pro or enterprise of either 10 or 8.1, we've got half a terabyte or 512 gig. So, and then there's, you could see the rest. Now, you need to know all about the hardware that you're using to know which software that you're going to install or can install. You need to know what you're going to do with that system to know what hardware you're going to or what software you're going to install. It's so much like if you go to buy a car, you need to know what functionality that vehicle needs to have to perform the tasks you want it to perform. 
if you're going to hard haul loads of dirt, I'm not going to buy a small Ford Focus. I'm not going to buy a car. I'm going to buy a truck because there's a certain utility that's required for what I need to do. The same thing holds true with a software. What is it that you're going to do with this system? What is the hardware configuration of this system? Those things are helping us decide which operating system we're going to choose. Now, if we're talking about Win 10, Win 8, Win 7, that 32-bit and 64-bit configuration, I need at least a 1 gigahertz processor. And it needs to support NXPAE and SSE2. So it, there's certain processor requirements. 32-bit, it needs to be at least 1 gig of RAM. For 64, it needs to be at least 2 gig of RAM for the system to run. And you need a certain amount of hard disk free space just to, unload, just to install the operating system and for it to work at a bare minimum. Now, beyond that, you would want to have more than it. If the bare minimum is 16 gig, I'd want to have at least twice that if I'm going to do an install. So if I had a 20 gig hard drive, I'm, I'm not looking to go install Win 7, 8, or 10 because it's not going to perform efficiently for very long. The same holds true with 20 gigs. So that gives us an idea of how much hard disk space is needed and what I'm going to have to do to have it. And then there are video requirements. Okay, So if you know these beforehand, what you have, then it will help you have an understanding of which operating system you can use and if your system will I even run any of those three. Now, we have to have an understanding of the partitioning of the hard disk. Now, a hard drive and has partitioning associated with it, and it, it'll have volumes. Now, the volume that we're going to deal with initially would be uh, the C drive or C volume. Now, let's say I have a hard drive, hard disk. I'll partition off a certain portion of the disk space for the operating system. And then I can reserve other space for storage. If that's the case, I can have the C drive, which is my primary operating system drive. And also uh, there's going to be what we call this master boot record or GPT partition that gets formed. Um, it, it's included in that C drive, but the C drive is even more than that. But we'll, we'll dig into that at a later date. Right now we're looking at how to get this thing installed and up and running. So that C drive, we call it the volume. It includes a file system that has everything the operating system needs to run. Uh, you're not limited to just that one C drive. Um, in the past, we had an A drive and a B drive, and those were old legacy floppy disk drives. D is tr traditionally a optical drive. D and E are traditionally optical drives. And then once you add on drives beyond that, they become any other kind of drive that we connect or file partition that we've created. So um, we'll talk later about the MBR and the GPT and they have to do with how we go about starting up or booting up the machine. Okay. So at this point we're looking at our operating system and We've got a user, they interact with the operating system. The operating system interacts with applications. Those applications are stored in that C drive. 
in with in along with the uh, operating system they may be integrated into the operating system or a part of the operating system depending on what they are but the operating system as a whole interacts with the kernel and then the kernel interacts with the device drivers for let's say the video card the peripherals the hardware the motherboard we've got the system bios and uefi and that is how the operating system recognizes what components exist within the system okay so we have to understand what the system has to understand what's there to be able to use it and that's this system using the bios and the uefi to recognize what's there so we've got two instances of that going on where it's talking to the hard drive talking to the motherboard we need device drivers to talk to things on the motherboard or components in the motherboard as well as like the cards so it could be onboard components required device drivers or expansion cards that require device drivers or a peripheral plugged into it So if we go beyond there, on the motherboard itself, you'll see, I think they call it a coin battery, button battery. It's a fairly standard battery. And these are for storing um, power to be able to hold some memory it's a it's a legacy concept it's to store memory when the computer's turned off now legacy computers use what we call as bios the current systems that we use are uefi now bios is basic input output system uefi is unified extensible firmware interface what does this mean when this computer goes to start up, it needs to know what exists and where the resources are to be able to start up. And in the legacy systems, that information was stored in the BIOS. So when we would go to power the system up, the BIOS on the motherboard had information about the basic configuration of this system and it would say okay to start up you've got a hard drive here's the hard drive that exists and on that hard drive you have this and here's where you go to find the files that you need and that's kind of like the procedures to get this thing up and running so it's the here's where you need to go to find what you need to find to start the computer that information existed on the motherboard in the past. And you may still run into computers that have it. And they were in chips, ROM chips on there. Not that you could not change it, but it's, ROM is read-only memory. And you can flash that ROM where you update it with new versions and whatnot. Now, let's talk about UEFI. UEFI doesn't store everything that it needs on the chips on there. It stores the information on the hard drive. So the new motherboards are intelligent enough to know how to go look for the hard drive, recognize the hard drive, and say, all right, I got the hard drive. The hard drive is where all the information I need is. And on that hard drive, are the files I need to start this operating system to get things up and running. So there's some information about BIOS and UEFI. Read through this. It is very important. Okay. Um, if you have a system that has been configured to use UEFI, and somebody, for whatever reason, decides they want to change a setting on your 
system to say, hey, instead of running on UEFI, we're going to run on BIOS. And then they shut your computer down. Your computer will not boot up. Because in, in essence, it's been told, don't go look for what you need on a hard drive or anywhere. I've got everything you need right here in the BIOS. And there is no BIOS. So there are no directions and the thing won't start up. It'll say no drive available or something along those lines. So you would end up having to go back into the system before it tries to start up and changing the system settings when it comes to the boot or setup. You just point to UEFI and say, we're going to do things using the UEFI method rather than BIOS. That's the configuration. Okay. Now, UEFI is required for anything over 2.2 terabytes. Okay. Or if you're using the GPT partitioning system. Now, here's a boot screen using UEFI and you'll see it in the labs and when I say labs I'm mentioning the virtual labs if this class is being taught in a face-to-face -face, would actually do this in the classroom using the system itself that we have hands-on if you're not in the classroom then we're having to use these virtual machines that I have set up for you now there may be times that we may use what's called dual boot or multi-boot and I can have a computer set up in a configuration that has multiple partitions to where we dictate which operating system we're going to run I could have an instance of Windows 10 Windows 8 or Windows 7 each on the same hard disk just their own partition and which one am I going to boot to why would I do that well I may want to do that in my class to have uh, the ability to boot up into Windows 10 or boot up into Linux and we're actually in the process of configuring some new systems that would allow us to do that it would have two separate hard disks boot to one for Linux, you boot to the other for Windows 10. So there are times that you may want to boot to or have multiple uh, boot options. Okay. Now we need to choose the type of installation. So the system that we're using, has anybody ever installed anything on it? Do I have an existing in place system? Or is it a clean install? Are we going to wipe out whatever's there? Or is there anything there to start with? So we need to know that. If one exists, are we going to keep the information that's there and just upgrade? We're limited in what we can upgrade. If I'm going to Windows 10, I can only upgrade from Windows 8.1 to Windows 10 Home. I can come from, and we've got the ability to expand this, and we can look at the entire chart here. So for Windows 8, we go from 8.1 to 10 Home. We go from 8.1 Pro to Win 10 Pro. So these are the options that we have for an upgrade. So, knowing that, we've got to see what we have to know where we're going to potentially go. So, we've got to have a good understanding of what hardware we're dealing with, what we want to do with it. We've got the ability to have dual boot, multi boot. And some things we need to keep in mind is if we're dealing with 32 bit or 64 bit, it has an impact on what we can do and how we go about things. Now, 
one of the things I want to hit on is why are you installing an operating system to start with? And if it's because your system crashed on you, that you may be able to repair what exists rather than going through all this. If you had something that worked for you, and it's got all your files, rather than doing a new install and lose all your stuff, you may want to repair it. And that's in a different chapter as far as going about how to fix it. Chapter 6 will talk about how to go about repairing a corrupted system. Now, when it comes time, and we're going to start the up the install, whether it's an upgrade or fresh install, they're both an install. Um, we may want to have more than one partition set up, and you know, if we're going to set up more than one partition, say we're going to have another partition for backup. Um, that's not a bad idea. We could have another partition for uh, storage so that if I do decide that I want to change my operating system, I'm just changing what's in that C drive. I'm not changing what's in the other partition. So then my other operating system can access what's in that drive. So that's an option. But if I'm creating another partition to back up my operating system components. But if that drive fails, it doesn't matter if I backed it up on that same drive. If the drive fails, it's gone regardless. So if I'm creating a backup, it's, I'm better served to have my backup on another drive, okay? An external drive, potentially. So just keep that in mind. If I'm creating multiple partitions, know why you're doing it before you do it. Now, I can do an install over a network and I need to have an understanding of how the network is configured to be able to do that network install. So we've got a checklist we've got to go down and here's a checklist what we've got to go down and we got that plus next to it to be able to expand it out. Questions we need to be able to ask before we do the install. Because at some point, we're going to be asked questions, and I better have the answer. And if I don't, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do the install. So I need to have things planned out ahead of time. So if we've got this checklist and all the information filled in, that'll help us when the time comes to answer these questions. And it could be, are you going to run BIOS? Are you going to be running UEFI? What's your uh, activation code? Uh, what's your network? What Any of those things, okay? So it will ask us to activate our license. Um, is it going to be an upgrade? Is it going to, how? Am I coming off of a DVD or an ISO file, which is an image similar to a DVD? Um, depending on whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit, we have to pick which version of the operating system we're going to run. So there's a Windows 10 for 32-bit. There's a Windows 10 for 64-bit. They are distinctly different. So if you have a 32-bit machine, pick the 32-bit option because it, it will choke along the way and, and won't do what you want it to do. It doesn't know what the hardware configuration is until it's long past the point of no return. Right? So we've got, we talked briefly here about an ISO, and that's an image file that I can connect to the um, system either on a USB or DVD and just boot off of that to do the install. That is an option. Okay. So, in looking at our install, we've thought about what it is we're going to use, what we're going to keep, 
how we're going to go about things. And if it's an upgrade, we need to decide up front, are we going to keep what we've got? We've got to have our key ready. Um, do we just want to start fresh or do we want to keep the files? Um, that's a, that's a tough decision sometimes because there are times when what we have on our existing computer is what the problem was. So if you're not going to keep the files, save them somewhere so that they are not gone. So before we do the install, if there's access to something that's there and you want a fresh install, save what you had. Okay. Um, decide what you want to keep. There's options where we can have that last decision on what we're going to keep and what we're not. So we've got to enter a valid product key. Um, we decide if we're going to update or if it's going to be a custom upgrade on the existing partitions and whatnot, or are we going to do a custom install? And then it'll go through the process and ask us the question. If we do a custom install, we have to decide how big the partitions will be, etc. That's something we talked about before. And then once we get to a certain point, we're having to go in and we'll have a Microsoft account to associate our install, our licensing with this Microsoft account. Should I have a network connection and my login be compromised or something happen, I can actually access the computer through my Microsoft credentials if it is a valid network connection. And a computer will end up talking to Microsoft and it confirms my identity if my password doesn't work or if something's happened. Okay. So I have the ability to sign in with or without a Microsoft account. Um, I prefer to use my Microsoft account so that should something happen down the road, I'm good to go. Okay. If I have multiple boots, I'll have that second or third partition reserved for the other operating systems. Okay. I pick which I want, whether it's Win 10, 8.1, I proceed. It has to be a valid key. There are different keys. An upgrade key and a new install key, are, they're not the same. Okay. So if we've got UEFI, whatever we're going to do, whether it's MBR or GPT, that will go to our C drive. We reserve the space. It has to be big enough for the hard drive, and then we proceed. Click Install Now, and it starts the install. Now, I could, let's assume my computer was corrupted somehow. I could, at this point, repair my computer, and it would give me the ability to potentially repair the start menu to get this thing up and going. That happens. I can go into a command prompt and run from there, or I can use the GUI interface. Okay, there are specific commands if you're going from a command prompt. All right, what do we do after we've done the install? We need to make sure that we've got network access, we've got to activate Windows, we're obviously going to have to go through and do updates because the build date on that instance of whatever it was, 110 or whatever, only has upgrades up to that point built into it. Anything beyond that point of manufacture, you're going to have to go install those updates. Those updates could take hours to install. Uh, you would then install your hardware, set up user accounts, permissions, um, install any apps you need, turn any features on and off, and we would want to do even if it's, and, and here they talk about laptops, not just laptops, desktops as well. Configure your power management settings. When this thing turns on, why and what happens. So we go through those different things step by step in here, and we've got that also in the labs how to go about activating it, and what to do. All right. um, we can 
set up the update. It doesn't have to happen now because you know there's nothing worse than to be in the middle of something and all of a sudden it comes up and does a reboot to do an update on you. And you don't have a choice. Do not stop an update when it's begun. It's just like uh, don't stop these installs if you're doing a fresh install. Don't stop it once it's started. Let it let it run out and then go from there. Okay. There's different ways to go do updates. There's Windows Defender is built in and you can have also other antivirus and malware protection aside from that. We've got to have, I talked about it before, drivers for any hardware. If it's legacy hardware, you could run into issues when it comes to drivers. Okay. So before you go to install something, look at the manufacturer to see if there is a driver for this device available, this operating system, I should say. Okay. And then we go up, up uh, inst update the driver, install any software along the way. Okay. So we can create different accounts. And we talk about that later as well, how to add users and what those user accounts are. The applications, this should be straightforward. Um, we're not uninstalling anything at the time of, or just after the fresh installation of Windows. There are things that are built into Windows. There are applications that are built in. Um, I use in many of my classes what's called Hyper-V. Internet Explorer 11, that's outdated. We don't use it, we use Edge now. So there are things that we can add in. There's containers, I don't think we've got Dockers in here. That's more on the networking side when we talk about that. But these things, we would go do the install, select what we want it to install, click OK. It will install it, then we'll have to um, reboot to have it actually happen. Now to see this, you would go into your start menu, and type in down in the search where that I shouldn't say start menu. Go into the search down where the magnifying glass is, and just type in "turn Windows features." You type those three words, it'll come up. Choose it, and then it'll give the options of what you want to install. I use Hyper V quite often for this virtual machine, so that hypervisor. We'll talk about this later. Hypervisor which is what runs Hyper-V, manages our virtual machines. And I can have these virtual machines that are compatible, and I talked about it last module, they're compatible with legacy hardware. Okay. So get used to waiting when it comes to this stage of the game. Because it's going to take a while. These things don't install in a matter of seconds or even a few minutes. It, it may take a half hour, hour to do an install, depending on what the install is and how much is being brought in and what's, what the system is, how fast the system works. Okay. So check and see for videos relative to the live virtual labs. Um, if you have a live virtual lab, Something I want you to make sure of. When it starts, there'll be a number of pages. Go to the last page, see if there are questions in it. Answer the questions first. If you didn't get them right, start over, answer the questions first again. Once you get those questions right, then go back to the beginning of the lab and start on the hands-on portion of the lab. I don't want you to spend an hour only to go answer the questions and not get them right and then have to start this thing all over again and do another hour just to get full credit for it. Answer the questions first and then go back to the beginning and do the live virtual lab step by step. All right. So I'll see you in the class. Ask questions early often. Uh, always reach out to the assignment support form with any help you need. And then if, if you can't get an answer there, reach out to me. Include course info in the subject line of any emails, any correspondence so I know which section you're in.